Senator, for the university and our guests, I thank you for your remarks on behalf of Senator Vanstone. It is now my privilege to introduce the Honorable Phil Honeywood, MLA, Victorian Minister for Tertiary Education and Training and Minister Assisting the Premier on Multicultural Affairs. Prior to his election to Parliament in 1988, Mr. Honeywood had a career in business and local government and was active in the Young Liberal Movement. Mr. Honeywood has a long association with Swinburne, having served on the University's Council for several years. Minister. Foundation Chan Chancellor Richard Pratt, Vice Chancellor Ian Wallace, Senator Kay Patterson, my parliamentary colleagues from the State Parliament, uh, Lorraine Elliott, Steve MacArthur, uh, Keith Hamilton, and I should add my former uh, colleagues, the Honourable Haddon Story and the Honourable Jim Ramsey, Chief Commissioner of the Shire of Yarra Rangers, Richard Longmire, and his fellow commissioners, ladies and gentlemen, and particularly the staff and students of this exciting new campus that we're witnessing the birth of today. I have a philosophy when it comes to my portfolio, and that philosophy has been enunciated at a number of fora that many of you have been present at, and it's a fairly simple one. It is a belief that my generation of Australians was the last generation in this country since the Great Depression of the 1930s, where young people could count if they studied hard or if they trained hard, they could count on a career outcome in the field of endeavour that they'd pursued. Unfortunately, the generations that have followed mine have not had that privilege, if it is a privilege. In other words, no matter how hard they study, no matter how hard they train, they won't necessarily get the career outcome, the vocational goal that they've strived for. And so therefore, I think it's incumbent on most of us here today looking around the room at the age groups as members of the more fortunate generations of Australians, it's incumbent on us to ensure that we provide future generations with maximum flexibility in terms of their skills training. And this in an environment in which employers increasingly and quite rightly in many cases, are uh, requesting government to ensure that we have very specialised training for our young people in all walks of life and particularly for their employment outcome. So the balance has to be, ladies and gentlemen, that what we do is we provide young people with specialised skills on the one hand that employers need, quite rightly, but we underpin that with skills that are portable and transferable from one vocation to another, particularly as the Bureau of Statistics inform us that young Australians can count on four or five fairly significant career changes in a typical working life ahead of them. Now, that philosophy I think many of you here would empathise with, particularly those of you who've got grandchildren or children who are finding it very hard to get employment in areas that they deserve employment in. But that philosophy of mine really comes back to, not just since I became Minister last year, but comes back to when I was first elected to Parliament in this area for the seat of Warrandyte, which then came right out virtually to the doorstep here and included Kilsyth and Chernside Park and uh, Croydon and Moorlbach. And that philosophy came about as a result of young people in particular coming to my electorate office in Croydon and saying to me, Mr Honeywood, we are discriminated against. And I said, well, what do you mean? Being sceptical when somebody first arrives at your door saying they're discriminated. And they said, quite simply, we have to travel half a day in order to access higher education. We have to sit on various buses and trains and trams to get from Croydon or Moorlbark or Louisdale to Monash University down at Clayton, to La Trobe University uh, over at Bandura, because quite simply, there is no local higher education access for us here. And yet, Mr Honeywood, we live in a region, the outer east of Melbourne, that has a population of over half a million people now. And so the philosophy I've just espoused was born out of that time when, as a young backbencher, I empathised particularly with school leavers who were finding themselves really wasting half a day often 
just to get to a university lecture in another part of Melbourne. And so therefore, it was with some great joy that I discovered one day a entrepreneurial, uh, I should say, I can say character because I know him well enough to call him that, an entrepreneurial character, very uh, dressed in a very dapper manner, uh, coincidentally with a Scottish accent, uh, and a terrier-like personality who appeared at my doorstep and said, have I got a deal for you? And uh, the deal was that he was going to buy a bankrupt uh, former private school, secondary school, and he was going to turn that private school complete with a childcare centre, I think it had in, and a swimming pool, and uh, basketball courts and everything. He was going to turn that into a university. Coincidentally, of course, Swinburne's future was in doubt at that stage because uh, a chap by the name of Dawkins was about to amalgamate a number of uh, universities and put them all uh, into the bigger is better syndrome. And Ian quite rightly saw the vision for Swinburne to be not gobbled up by La Trobe or another university, but to be independent, to be true to George Swinburne's vision for his institution all those years ago. And Swinburne is very unique, I have to say, as I'm sure many of the staff here, students here and former staff would attest to. And so it was really, I think, going back to Ian's determination, some might say stubborn determination, but a good bit of stubbornness goes a long way, to ensure the survival of Swinburne that really led to a fantastic lobbying effort. And from that day onwards, a number of us uh, joined in the fray, and I have to particularly pay tribute to, I think, Bruce MacDonald, who's sitting here in the audience somewhere. There you are, Bruce, in second row. I noticed John. John, you're five rows back. Put your hand up. And a few others here. And we stood at uh, a number of shopping centres on Friday nights and Saturday mornings, and we got something called a petition together to save our university site, even though we didn't tell anybody it hadn't actually become a university at that stage. And uh, we got 9,500 signatures, and I think it was a very proud moment in my career when I tabled that petition on behalf of this Outer East community to argue with the then state government that the Dawkins model of bigger is better conveniently ignored one particular point, and that was that unless you take education to where the people live, how can you hope, ladies and gentlemen, for people to access education opportunities? And I might add, not just for school leavers, but for mature age students as well, who those who live in this region, I'm sure you'd all agree, have a right to access higher education, particularly as they often have to change careers or they just want to reskill and update their skills as well. And it's very hard to do that when you've got young children or when you've got to get home from work, uh, if you work in the city, and instead of being able to pop out to Leadale to do that mature age study, you've got to go all the way down to Clayton or to Bundura or elsewhere. So there's a practical reason as to why this university has come about and it's a genuine reason, and it's a reason which I'm sure you'd all agree involves this community coming of age, because Lilydale is an appropriate university town. Lilydale has got that wonderful historical character, the tree-lined parks and streets, the historic homesteads, the hills, uh, I think just the whole combination of a lovely rural and semi-urban setting ensure that this is an appropriate place for a university town.